she might never have made it. She wasn't at the top of the candidate's shortlist. But eventually, she did blast off, shouting triumphantly. As the flight began, she was unable to switch to manual control. But after three days, the world greeted the first woman cosmonaut. Six years later, as her motorcade passed through the Kremlin gates, a man opened fire, and her car took nine bullets. She was untouched. <laughs> Valentina Tereshkova's biography reads a little like a fairy tale, a Soviet Cinderella. A girl from a poor family in a remote province rocketed to such heights that only the stars were above her. The first woman cosmonaut's glass slipper was the Vostok 6 spacecraft, which she first tried on in June 1963. It immediately elevated her to the Soviet elite. Her official call sign was Sea Girl. The name was to stay with Valentina forever. Long after her triumph, it still followed her around the world. Even in childhood, Valentina had dreamed about adventure and travel, although her earlier ambitions were confined to the Earth. There was a railway track not far from our house, and my biggest dream was to become a train driver. I wanted to drive those huge trains. I thought the train driver was the happiest person in the world. He could see all the big cities and travel all over the country. Her family was from a small country village where her mother, Yelena, was a milkmaid, and Vladimir, her father, worked as a tractor driver. As war broke out with Finland, he was conscripted into the army. The family heard of his death when Valentina was less than three years old. I belong to a generation of children of the war. We know what war grief is. Of course, we didn't realize it then, but we know what it's like for a mother to cry over a telegram saying her husband is dead. Our mother got 50 rubles for each of us. A loaf of bread cost 200 rubles after the war, so you see, she couldn't even afford bread with that allowance. But we never saw her cry. After the war, the family moved to Yaroslavl, where Valentina went to school until seventh grade. After that, she went to work, first in a tire factory, then a weaving mill. At the same time, she also attended the local trade school, and later she joined the local parachute club. There were notices everywhere you looked. They said, welcome to the parachute sport club. I could see parachutists as I went to work along the riverbank. They jumped on the other side of the river, lots of them. I don't think anyone could be unmoved by the sight of people jumping. Valentina Tereshkova's journey into space began with parachuting. I made my first jump on May 21st, 1959. Was I scared? Of course. Your first jump is very special. You realize that you're jumping off something solid. You have to overcome your fears. I opened the door and put my foot on the step. And then I pushed myself forward. In a sport like this, once you've made your first jump, you can never stop. Tereshkova didn't always achieve particularly good grades for her jumps. She averaged just four, or even three out of five. I often used to find her at the far end of the field where she'd landed after a jump. She'd be crying. Me? I never cried. Why should I? The job of assembling and training the first group of Soviet cosmonauts was delegated to Air Force Vice Commander Nikolai Kamanin. The idea of sending women into space is also attributed to him. We need young, strong girls in good shape so we can train them for the flight within five to six months. The main reason for such rapid training is to leave the Americans behind. 
These were the criteria for recruiting women. Age up to 30, height up to 170 centimeters, weight up to 70 kilograms, no less than 200 hours flying time or 50 parachute jumps. When selection began, Valentina already had a good score, 90 jumps. She also had one other advantage. She was head of the local Communist Party Youth Committee. At that time, only the most ideologically minded of people could be considered for space. It was here at the Yaroslavl Parachute Club that an Air Force officer arrived to select candidates for the Soviet space program. We noticed that he watched us jumping, working together, and then he called us in separately for an interview. The Cold War was at its peak. Both the US and the USSR were always trying to prove that their political system was best. Everything concerning space was highly classified. When Valentina was chosen to be one of the cosmonaut candidates, not even her mother was allowed to know. I had to make up some story to tell my mother. It was easy with the mill, but with mom. I invented this story. Mom, you know, I've been invited to become a reserve member of the USSR parachuting team in Moscow. A small team of women was brought together within the all-male cosmonaut department. Star City had yet to be built. There was just a regular military base with a high fence, 40 kilometers from Moscow. She was very mature when she joined the unit. She knew exactly what she wanted from life. Tereshkova did everything she could to avoid being discharged from the space program. The women's team was officially formed on the 12th of March 1962. Out of 5,000 candidates, just five were shortlisted. An engineer, Irina Solovyova, mathematician Valentina Panamaryova, weaver Valentina Tereshkova, teacher Jana Yokina, and typist Tatyana Kuznetsova. All of them had to undergo extensive preparation, including physical training, which was exactly the same as for the men. Doctors watched every training session very closely. They couldn't agree amongst themselves as to whether a woman's body could withstand the intense forces of blast-off, the weightlessness, or the stress of returning from orbit. One of the most demanding tests was the centrifuge. With its extreme G-forces, not all of them would pass. After the test, you get red spots on your skin, and they're caused by bleeding under the skin when small vessels burst. By this time, Yuri Gagarin had already been in space, along with German Titov, Pavel Popovich, and Andrian Nikolaev. These were four nationally recognized heroes. Gagarin was always smiling and easygoing, and often seen visiting the women's team. They once asked him about his most frightening experience during his flight. He said that the worst thing was when he was walking along a red carpet in Vnukovo with his lace undone. He was afraid that he was going to trip and fall over it in front of everyone. The newsreel caught this very moment as Gagarin, with his shoelaces undone, walks towards the Soviet leaders to report on the first successful space flight. The one person with absolute authority over the cosmonauts was Sergei Korolev, the chief engineer. It was thanks to him that the Soviet Union became the pioneers of space. Probably only Sergei Korolev could have criticized and loved us so much at the same time. We were both afraid of him and we adored him. We simply loved him. You can't choose your parents. And we were so unbelievably lucky to have been mentored by Korolev. Korolev's contemporaries say that he didn't support the idea of women in space at first. Initially, he thought that only male Air Force pilots should become cosmonauts. But later, he agreed to send a woman. And it was him who supported Valentina Tereshkova's candidacy. Although the final decision would be made not by Chief Engineer Korolev, but by the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev. Thanks to Nikita Khrushchev's intervention, and with the tacit approval of Sergei Korolev, 
Despite an unfavorable medical commission report, Valentina Tereshkova was appointed the number one cosmonaut among the women. Valentina's social origins played a major part in the decision. On the whole, she wasn't the best choice. I thought they'd choose Panamarova. Do you know why? She was a pilot. She graduated from Moscow State University, and she'd passed courses in higher mathematics. I thought it would be Panamarova, but it turned out to be Tereshkova. From the highest orbit, she represented her country as head of the Soviet Women's Committee and traveled the world as leader of the Friendship Society. There was, though, one moment that could have brought it all to an end. The frosty morning of January the 22nd, 1969. This was to be a happy day. A government delegation, including Tereshkova, was to welcome cosmonauts returning home from a routine flight. They immediately headed for the Kremlin. I was sitting in the middle of the car. Valentina and Andrian Nikolaev were behind me. I saw an officer in a blue uniform step out of the crowd and he started shooting at the car. Valentina was behind me and Andrian covered her body with his own. That's the truth. I was sitting on the side he shot at. They found nine bullets under my seat. I probably survived because I had a sick mother that needed my help and also a small daughter. God probably knew that and let me live. This was to have been an attack on the USSR's leader, Leonid Brezhnev. Viktor Ilyin, a Soviet army officer, approached the motorcade wearing a police uniform. His intention was to kill Brezhnev. But he fired at the wrong car, the one carrying the cosmonauts. He was immediately arrested and later declared insane. Wealthy British scion Zach Wilson, investment activist. Markets, finance, scandal. Find out what's really happening to the global economy in Kaiser Report on RT. Arguments over who was best prepared to be the first woman in space continued up until mid-May 1963. Sergei Korolev led the group supporting Tereshkova, 
and was later joined by Yuri Gagarin. On May the 21st, 1963, the training center welcomed the state committee. There we were, sitting at a long table that was covered with red fabric in one of the rooms at the training center. We had already been given the rank of junior lieutenant, so we were sitting there by the wall in our new uniforms, shivering with anticipation. Chief Engineer Sergei Karilyov could see that everyone had already guessed the final decision, and he addressed Panamaryova. He asked, Comrade Panamaryova, would you be offended? I said, yes, I would. I'd be very upset. And he said, that's right, I would be too. But he said, you'll all go into space. Sadly, that did not come true. Of the first woman's team, only Tereshkova made it into space. All the others spent several years in training until finally they heard the verdict in 1969. They expressed gratitude for our willingness to serve our country, but said our services were no longer required. So we were disbanded. Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich had made the first joint space flights into orbit in Vostok 3 and Vostok 4. Now there was a new goal. For the first time in history, a woman would fly into space. The mission would begin with Bukowski aboard Vostok 5, and then Tereshkova would blast off with Vostok 6. On June the 14th, 1963, at 5 p.m. local time, Valery Bukowski flew into space. The 15th of June, 24 hours before Tereshkova's planned flight, Doctors assure us that Tereshkova has a good appetite and has even gained some weight. But I still think that she has thinned down a lot, she looks pale and seems a little agitated. The 16th of June, 1963. These pictures went all around the world. Tereshkova's spacecraft launched with nothing untoward. So when the ship took off and I heard the command start, I shouted, hey Sky, take off your hat, I'm on my way. Tereshkova's relatives only heard of her flight from the radio. I had finished my first year at the trade college, and there were six or seven girls in the room where I was living in the dormitory. On the radio, they said that Valentina Tereshkova had flown into space. I was shocked. That was my cousin. I say, girls, it's my cousin, and they didn't believe me at first. It was hard to convince them. <laughs> That very day, Tereshkova spoke to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. All systems are working perfectly. I feel excellent. I can hear you very well. Your call signal is Eagle. But let me call you simply Valentina. Valentina, I'm very happy and proud that our girl, a girl from the Soviet Union, is the first woman to fly to space and to operate such cutting-edge equipment. But not everything was quite so perfect with that cutting-edge equipment. I spoke several times with Tereshkova. I heard she was tired, but she wouldn't admit it. Twice, she tried to orient the spacecraft, and she honestly said she'd failed to do that. Karolyov was nervous. Even though it was only a test procedure, Tereshkova couldn't do it. She couldn't operate the spacecraft manually. Today, the former cosmonaut claims it was because of an engineering fault. You see, there was an error in the program. When it was supposed to land, instead of descending from orbit, the ship was programmed to ascend. I entered the data sent from Earth into the program and was able to land safely. The doctors had a different opinion. 
Because the seagull didn't feel well under weightless conditions, she wasn't accurately executing her commands from Earth. The first 24 hours were really bad for her. She felt nauseous, but nobody flies up there feels great. At that time, the first Soviet woman in space could not afford mistakes, nor to reveal any weakness. She was to be a legend even before leaving the ground. It was much later that there would be speculation about the problems with that flight and the fact that she fell asleep at an inappropriate time. There was also talk of two broken pencils that had allegedly prevented Tereshkova from keeping proper records in the ship's logbook. There was only one pencil. No, it didn't break, no. You know, sometimes they ask me to deny these stories, but I don't think there's any need to. An honest person would never believe them. You must understand that those were the first space flights. We had to prove that a human could function even aboard a spacecraft in those conditions. There are certain professional issues that shouldn't be discussed in public. These things often happen at work and during every space flight, even today. The first female cosmonaut landing was far from smooth. It was very clearly stated that she must not raise her head. You're strapped in the capsule and you must lie still. Well, a woman's curiosity got the better of her. When the hatch opened, she looked out and at that moment she was ejected and her helmet hit the bridge of her nose. So we bailed out and our ships had their own parachutes. They were supposed to open at a height of four kilometers, while ours were at seven kilometers. When I looked down, what did I see? My God, there was a lake. I thought there's no way I'm going to fall there, but what could I do? The wind was extreme, up to 17 meters a second. Well, I even had to stand on my head and unfasten the parachute locking clips. The moment she landed, she was immediately surrounded by locals. People brought her some foods, like boiled potatoes and milk. She ate that and handed out her own food as souvenirs to them. She shouldn't have done that because we had to keep metabolic records of the flight, how much she'd consumed, her excretions, what quantities and so on. But she gave everything away so we couldn't analyze it. Her spur-of-the-moment behavior was a minor detail. Above all, she had returned alive. A woman blasted into space for the first time in 63. Russia sent Valentina Tereshkova on a 48 orbit ride. I have been alone in space for quite some time, so it was especially rewarding to be joined in orbit by such a charming comrade as Valentina Tereshkova. I hope your wife didn't hear that. I'm so happy to have been granted the honor of being the first woman in the world to go into space. The bourgeoisie always emphasize that women are the weaker sex. Now, here you can see a typical Soviet woman who in the eyes of the bourgeoisie is weak. Look at what she has shown to America's cosmonauts. She showed them who's who. There on the podium in Red Square, Tereshkova stood shoulder to shoulder with Andrian Nikolaev. It's said that Gagarin hinted to Khrushchev that perhaps there should also be a first space couple. The wedding was organized under Khrushchev's personal supervision. The 
couple had a baby girl, who Tereshkova named Yelena, after her mother. These are rare pictures of the first woman in space, bringing her daughter to a video connection with Andrian Nikolaev, who was once again in orbit. Daddy, we went to the bee garden and Uncle Yosha, he got stung by a bee. After 19 years of marriage, Tereshkova and Nikolaev eventually divorced. Valentina doesn't like to speak either of her first marriage or her second to the Soviet Defense Ministry's chief surgeon. The first woman cosmonaut now has two grandsons, Alexei and Andrei. The eldest finished school this year and wants to be an economist. At first, my eldest son wanted to be a pilot, but in time, he ended up changing his mind. The youngest claims he wants to be a cosmonaut. We'll see. He's like that. If he says he'll do something, maybe he will and maybe he won't. <laughs> my grandmother and my grandfather were cosmonauts. They did the trampoline. I wanted to try it too. Jumping on the trampoline is my favorite hobby now. Just like 50 years ago, Valentina Tereshkova has no time to spare in her regular working day. She's a member of the State Duma. She went into space just once, but she will always be the first woman in space, a fact confirmed by every encyclopedia and internet search engine. Tereshkova still dreams today. Now she's ready to join an expedition to Mars, her favorite planet, even though it would be a one-way trip. This is my profession. It has been since the end of 1961, when I was invited to Moscow to go to the selection commission and training. And from 1962 until today, I've been closely involved with this profession and this training center. This has been my life, and I can't imagine living any other.